Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to be with you again. <coughs> I want this morning to talk to you, and I've entitled the subject, It's All About Finishing. Now, I know it's not New Year, but at the beginning of a new year in this country, I don't know about anywhere else, a lot of people make New Year's resolutions. Okay. And it's said that most New Year's resolutions last about 11 days. In other words, the majority of people who make New Year's resolutions never keep them. They don't finish. Now, there's nothing wrong with making a New Year's resolution, but it becomes quite pointless if you don't see it through. And I, I would just like to speak to you this morning about the importance of finishing what we start. You see, anyone can start. When the London Marathon takes place, there's thousands of starters. But a lot of people don't make it to the finish line. Give them full marks for trying, but really it's all about finishing. Starting the marathon is relatively easy. We could all do it. But it's finishing that really counts. I don't think I could ever climb Mount Everest, so I'm not even going to try. But those who do, before they get to the peak to celebrate, they have to make a lot of effort. And they probably finish up there exhausted, but triumphant. So, it's all about finishing. Over the years of my pastoral ministry, which started in 1959, I've had the privilege of being involved in five building projects. Two in my first church, and three when I moved to Leighton. And I can tell you right now, <coughs> the best part of any project is finishing. The Bible says, better is the end of a thing than the beginning. Jesus said, he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. And to back up that argument, God is very much into finishing what he starts. Take, for example, the following. God <coughs> and creation. At the end of each of the first five days of creation, we read, and God saw that it was good. At the end of the sixth day of creation, we read, and God saw that it was very good. <coughs> God was satisfied. <coughs> he was pleased that he had finished what he had started. And comes the seventh day, which became a day of Sabbath rest, in which God was able to take pleasure and great satisfaction in looking back and viewing all that he had made. God started creation. He finished it. And despite the ravages of sin, disease, famine, earthquakes, wars, it's still a very, very beautiful world. God is good at what he does. Sadly, after God finished the creation, sin quickly came into the world. But you know something? God had a plan already. And over the centuries, <coughs> he worked towards the fulfillment of that plan. And that is why Genesis begins with a garden paradise and ends in the book of Revelation with a garden paradise. And then there was the tabernacle. 
God wanted to dwell in the midst of his people. Israel. In a meaningful way. And so he gave to Moses instructions how, on how to build a tabernacle or tent. This tent would be fully portable and would move with them wherever they went on the way to the promised land. God gave Moses the plan, the design, the dimensions, the materials, the personnel that would operate the tabernacle. The layout was such that the tabernacle was right in the center of the camp of Israel. Three tribes on the north, three on the south, three on the east, three on the west. Twelve tribes. God was in the midst. But came the day, Exodus 40, when Moses finished building the tabernacle. And you know, God was so pleased that he came down and filled the tabernacle with his glory. I mean, in Israel today, down in the south near Elat, there is a reconstruction of the original tabernacle. It's built exactly the same dimensions with all the fittings and exactly as the original tabernacle. And I'll never forget taking a group down there one year. And the Messianic Jewish lady that was our guide, she walked us through the tabernacle to the Holy of Holies. And I'm not kidding you, heaven came down that day. Incredible, the sense of God's presence as she walked us and talked us through the tabernacle to the Holy of Holies. God was pleased when the tabernacle was finished and crowned it with his visit. And then we move on <coughs> a few hundred years and we come to the first temple of Israel built by King Solomon. This was not a tent. This was a building coated in solid gold. And you could see it from many, many miles away because of the brilliance of its appearance. Now this was obviously a permanent structure. Because God by now had chosen Jerusalem as the place where he would dwell amongst his people. We read in Psalm 132 verse 13. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell. For I have desired it. God chose Jerusalem. To be his dwelling place on the earth. Ezekiel tells us that God has set Jerusalem at the center of the nations. Jerusalem has got a future. It's had a checkered past, but it's got a glorious future. But again, when the temple was finished, came the day for the dedication. And again, the glory of God came down. To fill the temple. To such an extent. The priests could not stand to minister. So awesome was the presence and the glory of God. That they had to just sit. Or just stand. And, and just sense the presence of God. It's all about finishing. Then we got <coughs> a different scenario. Nehemiah's wall. You know, when Nehemiah was in exile, he was a cupbearer to the king. That's not a bad job, except for the fact that back then, before the king took his glass of wine, the cupbearer had to sample it, just in case it was poisoned. So it was a, bit, a little bit risky, being a cupbearer. But nevertheless, 
Nehemiah got the confidence of the king. And he was, <coughs> he was always listening out for news from Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem had been broken down. Then one day he heard that some very bad news about the situation in Jerusalem. It, the walls were broken down. The gates were burnt. It was in a shocking state. But God gave Nehemiah favor with King Artaxerxes, who gave him permission to return to Jerusalem to do something about the broken down city. And on his return, he set about immediately getting men to help him to rebuild the whole walls of Jerusalem. In fact, the whole project was completed in just 52 days. Everybody, if, if you read Nehemiah 3, you've got a whole list of people who took part. I mean, goldsmiths. They've got very delicate hands. But they mucked in. They had all sorts of skilled people just doing menial work with a view to rebuild the city. And of course, it resulted in great celebration. You know, God is pleased when we get excited about His work and about Him. And then we move on <coughs> many centuries later. We come to the cross of Calvary from where Jesus cried, It is finished. He didn't say, I am finished, because he wasn't. He said, It is finished. The work of redemption, the work of salvation. And the cross was the culmination of all the Old Testament prophecies. The work of atonement and redemption was complete for mankind. And then, of course, the work of the cross, which was insufficient of itself, was sealed by the resurrection. Because if Jesus had only died, he would have been another martyr. Died and buried. But he died, was buried, but he rose again. <coughs> that puts him... <coughs> In a very unique situation. In fact, God was so pleased with his son and his sacrifice that 50 days later, to celebrate the cross, God sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And the coming of the Holy Spirit was a sign from heaven that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was pleasing to God. And as Isaiah 53 says, He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. So God was pleased with the finished work of the cross. It was a triumph. It was a victory. But then there's a few other pictures of finishing in the Bible. Joshua 8.26 After Israel entered the promised land, they began to conquer the many cities, starting with Jericho. The second city they were to conquer was Ai. <coughs> and although there was a bit of a hiccup over Ai because... Some people went presumptuously to capture it, thinking we only need a few men, and they got defeated. So Joshua had to get before the Lord and find out what was going on, because defeat wasn't part of their, part of their scenario. And so they dealt with the situation, and Achan sadly paid with his life for breaking the law. And God gave Joshua a strategy. God told him, Point your javelin or your spear towards Ai. And keep it pointed in that direction until Ai falls. And in verse 26 of Joshua 8 we read, Joshua did not draw back his hand with which he stretched out the spear 
until he had utterly destroyed Ai and its inhabitants. He had to keep his spear pointed until the deal was done, until it was finished. Then there's the Apostle Paul. When Paul was in prison, <coughs> near the end of his life, he writes in the second letter to Timothy those wonderful words. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Paul finished well. He was able to say with a sense of deep satisfaction and triumph, I've fought the good fight. I've done my best. I've finished the race. I've stayed the course. I've kept the faith. It's the old song we used to sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. There was no turning back with Paul. He saw it through to the end. Before he died, Paul could list a catalogue of things he went through for his faith. We don't have time to read them all now, but 2 Corinthians 11. Boy, <coughs> I've often said it makes James Bond look like Mickey Mouse. When you see what Paul went through. Shipwrecked, hungry, thirsty, in fear, in prison, in trouble from all sorts of people. I mean, he went through the lot. But he never gave up. But you know it's not just for Paul. It's for all of us who believe in Jesus. Galatians 6, 9 says, And let us not grow weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. If we keep going. There is a reward. Earlier in the same letter of Galatians, Paul said to his readers, You did run well. Who has hindered you from obeying the truth? <coughs> some were faltering. Some were wavering. Some were tempted to go back. And in fact, in, in John chapter 6, we read of some of Jesus' own disciples who turned back and walked no more with him. How disappointing was that for Jesus after he had invested so much in their lives. And as these disciples left him and followed him no more, Jesus turned to the twelve and he said, Will you also leave me? And Peter replied, Who else but Peter? Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of life. If you don't keep following Jesus, who are you, you going to follow? Who are you going to turn to? There's no one. Only Jesus. And so Peter summed it up for the rest of the disciples. Lord, we can't afford to stop following you. Because you've got the secret of life. You can contrast that with the children of Israel. When only two of the whole nation that came out of Egypt. They reckon on... As estimated that two and a half million Israelites came out of Egypt. It's quite sobering to think that only two out of that vast number actually crossed the Jordan into the promised land. Only two. The rest did not finish the course. What a waste. But one of those, that's Joshua and Caleb, one of those who did make it was Caleb. And in Joshua 14 we discover that Caleb had some unfinished business. You see, <coughs> he had never received his full inheritance, which had been promised 45 years earlier. Now, here he was, 85 years old. And still 
raring to go. And he said to Joshua, I am just as strong today as on the day that Moses sent me to spy out the land. Therefore, give me this mountain. He had unfinished business. Part of his inheritance had never been claimed. But he never lost sight of it. He never gave up. He never lost the vision for it. And even at 85, when most people hang up their boots, or something like that, he was still raring to go. I must confess, Caleb is one of my all-time heroes in the Bible. I would like to be like Caleb. I'm not quite his age yet. But I, I just admire his spirit, his attitude, his outlook. Never give up. Joshua blessed him. And he got the rest of his inheritance. Why? Because he didn't give up. It was the same Joshua who at the end of his life said, not one good thing has failed of all the Lord promised. And I can't help but feel that Paul the Apostle had something of the spirit of Caleb about him. And as I've said, Caleb's spirit is something that I've always aspired to. There's another character <coughs> in the Bible who finished well. His name is Jabez. Now I know that reading the Bible is a challenge for some and you've got those chapters that are a list of endless names. And I'm sure that most of us, if not all of us, have been totally, sorely tempted to flick over those pages and pick it up where it starts after all the names. The only problem with that is this. You could miss some gems. I, I read all the names just to help me, as a speaker, to pronounce them properly. I don't, I don't know whether I succeed or not. But Jabez, his name, which his mother gave him at his birth, actually means misery. Because before he was born, his mother had a lot of pain. So, just to reward him, she called him misery. I don't think that was very kind to you. Fancy calling a child misery. What's some, what is something to lumber him with for the rest of his life? But you know something? That didn't faze Jabez. He was not willing to let the meaning of his name define his life. Or his future. So he prayed to God and this is what he said to God and this is what you miss if you don't read through the names. 2 Chronicles 4. This is what he said. This is misery speaking. Oh that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory that your hand would be with me and that you keep me from evil and deliver me from pain. And God granted his request. He overcame the negativity of his name. And he came good. And was successful. As I've said. The point of this story is that he finished well. Much better than the way he started. <clears throat> and then. As we're getting towards the end. The parable of the sower. Can also help us understand. The importance of producing. Or finishing. First of all, you have the seed that fell by the wayside. And the birds of the air came and ate it up. Now the birds represent the devil, who delights in snatching the seed of God's word from us. And the main method the devil uses to take God's word away from us is doubt. He is never more present than when God's word is being preached. And the way he does it is to whisper a doubt in your ears. And the moment you accommodate that doubt, you virtually lost the battle. Remember the serpent in the Garden of Eden? 
his approach to Eve. Now, I have a theory here. Adam and Eve, husband and wife. Adam was the head of the house. He was the first one to be created. Strictly speaking, when the serpent came to Eve, she should have said, you better ask my husband. But she took it upon herself to answer the question. And it was too late by the time she'd finished answering the question. Because the serpent said to Eve, and he knew what he was doing. He knew that, strictly speaking, he should have approached Adam the head. But he knew that the wife should have been submitted to her husband. And he said, has God said? He, he approached Eve. He, he sowed a seed of doubt in her mind. And she accommodated that doubt. And the next thing she was eating the fruit and... It was my wife who pointed out to me that actually Adam was standing right by the side of her when she took the fruit. Why didn't he open his mouth? He was failing his head even then. Don't touch it. But she accommodated the doubt. And God's word was lost. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So the first approach of the devil was to sow doubt, to take the seed of God's word away. Then you have the seed sown in stony soil. In this sto soil the, sp the seed sprang up immediately. But the seed could not penetrate the stony soil and therefore it withered. It had no roots, no, no substance, no foundation. And this seed speaks of people who believe for a while. But when temptation comes, they fail to continue. There's no depth. There's no substance to them. And the devil's weapon of choice here is discouragement. That is one of his most successful tools to get you down. To discourage you. To take the shine off things. It was tough. And it is tough to be a Christian. It's getting harder by the day. Even in this country. I mean we're really up against it with the woke culture. And all the rest of the nonsense that's going on. And Christians are losing their jobs simply because they express an opinion. I'm sure you've heard the latest one. The girl who said she's a cat. And the teacher reprimanded the girl who questioned it. What's the world coming to? Discouragement. But then there's the thorny soil. Which talks about the seed that is crowded out through thorns and thistles. And we know that thorns and thistles represent riches, cares, anxieties, pleasures. Now we all know that if you've only got a garden box... There's always weeds to compete with flowers. And the weeds usually win unless you deal with them. And by the way, weeds don't need fertilizer. They have got enough about them to grow and thrive, choking out the flowers or the shrubs. And the devil's weapon of choice here is distractions. As I said, Jesus talked about riches and pleasures and cares being major distractions in our lives. There's a little story which I think I've quoted before. It's a, it's a lovely story really, with a, with a sad outcome. The king of Israel was asked to guard the king of Syria. Okay? The prophet said to him, look after him. Guard him with your life. But we read of the king of Israel who said... As your servant was busy here and there, he was gone. In other words, he took his eye off the ball. He was distracted by whatever. We don't know what he was distracted with. But 
He didn't keep his eye on the prisoner that he should have been guarding and the prisoner got away. And the prophet was not pleased at all. The fourth type of soil is the good soil. This seed was planted in good soil and produced a good crop. And the reason this soil produced a good crop was because it was matched with determination. It had a good root. It was planted in the right place. And there was a corresponding determination to see it through. The first three types of soil all failed to produce because they allowed doubts, discouragements and distractions to hinder them. And so to truly succeed and finish well, we need to overcome all the negatives and press through to victory. I've already quoted, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. You see, God is into finishing. And he wants us all to finish well. What is the secret then of finishing well? Well, it means having a focus in life. It means having the perseverance to go with it. Like Caleb. Somebody once said, winners never quit. And quitters never win. God gave Moses a pattern for the tabernacle. He gave Nehemiah a burden to build the walls. God gave Ezekiel a vision to see through. And God gave Jesus and Paul a passion for a lost world to fulfill. Jesus once said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. John 17, 4, I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. God can ask of nothing more of you than to finish the work. Acts 20, 24, the apostle. However, he says, and he was being warned about trouble he was going to face in Jerusalem. I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Paul's only passion in life was to finish what he started. Hebrews 12.2 Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus never took his eye off the ball. He followed it through. Another verse to back that up is found in Romans 8.29, for we read, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. It seems to me as if we are destined to finish well. But, that doesn't only require God's part, it requires our part, the perseverance to go with it. The Bible says of Jesus that he set his face as a flint to go to Jerusalem. The reason Nehemiah succeeded was because he was so focused and determined to see it through. Now you know, many people like to receive prophetic words for their lives. But what they don't realize and... You only, go, you only learn this the hard way, is that getting a prophetic word about your future is the easy part compared to its outworking. A very dear friend of mine, Pastor John Barr, who's now with the Lord, had the most unique prophetic gift I've ever encountered. And many years ago, when I was at Aldershot, he prophesied over me a string of things. I just couldn't get my head around it at the time. Because I was in a small church in a little town. And some of the stuff he prophesied over me, I just couldn't see it happening. However, I did not reject it. I trusted his word. 
And if you will, I put it on the top shelf, you know, for later. And then lo and behold, God stirred the nest. And we, re we relocated to Leighton, East London. That was the beginning of the fulfillment of those prophetic words. Within a few months of coming to Leighton, I was on my way to Nigeria. And then to Ghana seven or eight times. And then to East and West Africa 17 times. To Cyprus a dozen times. To Israel over a hundred times. He said I would have a ministry to the nations. Couldn't get my head around it. He said I would be a pastor to pastors. I became a regional superintendent. Couldn't believe it. But let me tell you something. For all of those things to come to pass, which they all did, it took 15 years. 15 years. So a prophetic word may be instant. It may be immediate, but it may not be. And you've got to wrestle with it and hold it and hang on to it and believe it and trust for it. And to keep persevering. And I just thank God and I would not be here today but for John Barr's input into my life. But boy, it took some working out. I thank God I never gave up. Remember Joseph? He had a dream, didn't he, about his future? That his brothers were going to bow down to him. Little did he know the route he would have to take to get to that position. He was thrown into a pit. He was sold to Ishmaelites. He went to Potiphar's house and was accused of rape. Got thrown into prison. When he was in prison, the butler and the baker came in and he helped them out. But one of them, when he was restored to the palace, completely forgot about Joseph as he had promised to mention him to the Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh got in trouble and the butler remembered and Joseph came out of prison. 16, 17 years of suffering. And all of a sudden, he was elevated to number two to Pharaoh. What happens? His brothers are sent by Jacob their father because there's a famine. They don't recognize him on their first visit. That's a clue. It was only on their second meeting that Joseph was revealed to them. That's just like the Jews. When he came the first time, they didn't recognize him. When he comes back again, they are going to recognize him. But he had a lot to go through. David, he was anointed king long before he came to the throne. He was on the run from Saul for years. Esther, her pressures only increased after she was chosen to be queen. But the Bible says, Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. He's the, the starter and he's the finisher. And, it's, and I'm going to close with this. Like an architect... You see, an architect visualizes from the beginning something he wants to construct. So he gets a concept in his mind, he commits it to paper, and from there he works towards its completion. At no stage does he deviate from his drawings... And when the building is finally finished, it is exactly as he visualized it. Now, we're a work in progress. We're not the finished thing. We're somewhere between the footings and the roof, if you know what I mean. We're on the way. Thank God we're on the way. But the master architect, Jesus, he's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's overseeing the project. And he will see us through, provided we keep up with him and we persevere. And that is why we're all on a journey to our destiny. And like an architect, the architect keeps in his mind from day one the finished building. And it will not be complete until it is complete. And like an architect, God sees us as the finished article. We're not there yet, but that's God views us like an architect. He sees what will be. So you're on the way. And God is the master architect and he's overseeing you. 
And he will bring you to completion if you continue to trust him. Because God sees us as the finished article, even though we're not finished. That is why the Bible says we have been predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. It's written in the book. And that is why Paul, the writer to the Hebrews says, you need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. And James 1 tells us, the testing of your faith develops perseverance. So I just pray that these words today will encourage you. Folks, it's all about finishing. Never take your eye off the ball. Never take your eye off the finishing line. God has destined us to succeed, to come through, to make good, to be the completed article. And I pray that for each one of us, we will <clears throat> hear those words one day. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've finished. Come home. Take a rest. May the Lord bless you. Amen.